These people are part of an experiment. We are about to test the urban myth, six degrees of separation. The idea that in a world of more than six billion people, everyone is connected in just a few steps. That's to say that you know someone who knows someone who knows someone who knows someone who knows me or anyone else on the planet. When scientists began exploring six degrees, they made some profound discoveries. Nature has a hidden blueprint, a structure that connects us all. The world is more highly, more globally, and more unexpectedly connected than we ever thought. Scientists are now investigating whether the power of six degrees can defeat terrorism, predict pandemics, and perhaps even cure cancer. And if it does, the one person we can thank is Hollywood actor Kevin Bacon. Vidal is a geneticist at the Dana-Farber Cancer Institute in Boston. He's the target of our experiment to test six degrees of separation. The claim that everyone on the planet can be connected to everyone else in just a few steps. Is it real or just an urban myth? We'll find out. Bei über 6,8 Milliarden Menschen auf der Welt wird es, denke ich mal, ganz schön schwierig, die richtige Person ausfindig zu machen. We've chosen 40 people from around the world to see if they can get a package to Vidal. Our participants have never met him, and they aren't allowed to look him up on the internet. The rules are simple. They must try and get their package to Boston by passing it to family or friends, people they know on a first-name basis. Will any of the packages make it to Boston? And how many steps will they take? Eight. Eight steps, maybe. College student Jessica Otto is one of our starters. She lives in the German town of Willig, near Dusseldorf. She's planning to send her package to a friend in Canada. I've sent the package to Kat. I thought because her boyfriend, he studied in Boston and he has to do something with physics and I thought he would know a lot of professors and I'm pretty sure that one of those knows Mark Vidal. Testing six degrees of separation is not a trivial matter. A decade ago, the idea began intriguing a small group of researchers trying to explain the world with math. It would eventually lead to a new discipline, the science of networks. One of the founders of the science is Professor Steve Strogatz. His path to discovery began with a broken love affair. Romeo's love increases the more Juliet is currently loving him. So our dot will be A. The more that Romeo currently loves her, the more that she recoils and wants to run away and hide. <laughs> the equation looks like this. I, I had a tumultuous relationship. It was the first relationship of my life with a, a girl in college, and I couldn't understand what she was doing to me. And uh, whenever I seemed to get closer to her and try to, to show her how much I loved her, she would back away. And then when I realized I better give up, this isn't going anywhere, then she was strangely attracted to me. And this push and pull felt to me, and probably this is why I had so much trouble with her, it felt to me like a mathematical equation. Having successfully conquered romance with equations, Strogatz turned his attention to other mysteries. Nothing had perplexed him more than the phenomenon known as synchronicity. How can a population of dissimilar individuals suddenly synchronize? 
How do fireflies flash in unison or crickets chirp as one? How does order emerge from chaos? We're so used to thinking that if there's a group following acting in concert, it's because there's a conductor for the orchestra. But that's not necessarily so. There's a hundred billion brain cells acting like a, the most complicated thing in the universe. And there's no cell that is the master conductor of the brain. The brain does it as a group. The heart has 10,000 pacemaker cells that tell the rest of the heart when to beat. Who's in charge? Who's the pacemaker for the pacemaker? Nobody. Strogatz was not alone in his passion for the simple elegance of numbers. Duncan Watts also wanted to make sense of the world with math. Here we are sort of just kind of shambling through uh, life, trying to make sure the wheels don't come off, but nothing like science. And I started to think, this is what I should be devoting my life to, to try and bring something like science to this, this real world. Watts had abandoned a promising career as Australia's top naval graduate to study physics. And when he arrived at Cornell University, Strogatz knew this was no ordinary grad student. When I walked by his office, I saw a picture of him hanging by his fingertips from uh, a sheer cliff in Australia. And I thought that's the kind of person that I could see myself working with on a difficult problem. Together, they began investigating the mystery of synchronicity. And for that, they needed a real world example to study. It occurred to us that actually here in Ithaca, we have the world champion of synchronization called snowy tree crickets. On a warm summer evening, thousands of them will all start chirping in unison. If we could capture some of these crickets, could we predict from an individual's behavior how an enormous population of hundreds or thousands of crickets would behave as a group? So we would find a tree and then I would clamber up in the tree with a flashlight on my head and a little glass vial and try and find these critters. Well, the hope was that each individual cricket was actually obeying little mathematical rules, unconsciously. I would sit there for, you know, three hours, waiting for the crickets to chirp, and they wouldn't chirp. Testing individual crickets would never work. The answer seemed to lie elsewhere, in their interaction as a group. You have hundreds of these crickets, and they're all sort of interacting with each other in some kind of complicated way. And the question that came up in my mind over and over again was, you know, who is listening to whom? And so that got him thinking more generally about patterns of connections, about networks. And it was around that time that something his father said came into his mind. Do you know that you're only six handshakes from any person on Earth. And I started to think, maybe it's true that, the, that this six degrees of separation phenomenon applies in the real world. And what are the consequences if that's true? And it was almost a scary thought, because we could see, when he, when he suggested it to me, that, that we were on the brink, if we could do anything sensible, of a whole new science that didn't exist yet. Almost by accident, they'd stumbled across a huge gap in our knowledge. Amazingly, no one before had paid much attention to the structure of networks. It was at that you know, pivotal moment I really sort of forgot about the crickets and started to think about networks. In our experiment to test six degrees of separation, people from all over the world are trying to send a message to a person they don't know. Professor Mark Vidal in Boston. In Paris, dancer Nadia Tomasova believes her letter has a good chance of making it. I think somebody could send this to me because maybe as I traveled around the world, 
It makes me very connected around the world, yeah. I'm sending it to my friend in Boston, to uh, Josephine Pra. She's a ballet dancer. I hope she will get it. Nadia is part of an international network of dancers. To her, the big world appears small. In a Kenyan village, one of our participants is struggling with a problem. Nialoka knows everyone in her village in Nyamware, but none of them seems to know anyone who can get the package closer to Boston. In Yamware, the world still seems very large. But it's not a problem restricted to Kenyan villagers. No matter where we live or what we do, we all tend to know people like ourselves. We're clustered into closed circles, locked within our own social networks. This is the paradox at the heart of the small world problem, that the, the world is simultaneously very small, with everyone only a few steps from everyone else, and yet very clustered. Solving this paradox was the key to understanding the secret of six degrees. So we just started to play around. It was pure mathematics, fun and games, where a network is thought of as points connected by lines. And then asking whether they would have the property of being a small world, meaning that everyone is only a few uh, hops away from everyone else in the network. Watts began with a thought game a mathematical model. Imagine uh, we, we have a crowd in a soccer stadium. And now imagine that you're trying to do the experiment of getting a message from this part of the stadium to the farthest remote part of the stadium. And the only way that we can get a message is to talk to the person next to us. Right, and then that person has to talk to the person next to them. It's going to take a very long time for the message to get from there to there. Now, if I give the person on the other side of the, uh, uh, the soccer stadium a, a walkie-talkie, and I have the other one, we can communicate immediately. Clearly, our path length has shrunk, because now the person next to me can communicate with the person on the other side of the stadium simply by asking me to put a call. All of a sudden, a whole group of people in my local neighborhood can connect to a whole group of people on the other side of the stadium in many, many fewer steps than they could before this one link came into existence. Just a single random link has an enormous effect. And add just a few more links and distance at the stadium has all but disappeared. The world doesn't gradually get smaller. It drops off a cliff. Here was a model that could easily make a big world small. Does our experiment show any sign of it happening? In the Kenyan village of Niamware, Nialoka's package has been going nowhere. But as Watson Strogatz's theory predicts, just a single link can make a big difference. Hey. 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 She's the link to the outside world. Like to meet Margaret. Welcome. Come in. Uh -huh. I've come to pick your package. Thank you. I don't know anybody in Boston. I don't even know this Mark Videl. But I know somebody in New York. I know a lady called Didi Halleck. Hello, ma'am. 
Emirates Express package from Kenya. From Kenya? Oh, it must be Margaret. Thank you so much. All right, thank you, ma'am. Oh, I'll have to open it. I was in Kenya uh, last summer working with Margaret Owino, and she's an old friend, and I thought her husband's some kind of scientist. I thought maybe if I send it to Lee Min, she, could, she would also be able to somehow connect. A key part of the small world phenomenon, the six degrees effect, is that all of us know someone who has moved away and has now forged a link between us and, and geographically distant communities. That random connection is bringing the whole world together, and it's happening all across the world with everybody. Watson Strogatz had a theory, but now they needed to prove it by studying real networks. The problem was no one had thought it worth mapping any, except one. Scientists don't normally associate Hollywood with the real world, but here was the first chance to test their ideas. More than a million actors have worked in Hollywood on half a million films. Here was a huge network of connections. In the mid-90s, some college students devised a trivia game linking every actor through the films they'd worked on to just one star. Kevin Bacon. Rodney Dangerfield was in Caddyshack with Bill Murray, and Bill Murray was in She's Having a Baby with Kevin Bacon. Back then, Brett Chayden was a computer student with too much time on his hands, and he thought it would be fun to turn the Kevin Bacon game into a website. Welcome to the Oracle of Bacon at Virginia website. I wrote a program that would extract the path uh, from every actor or actress to Kevin Bacon. Before I knew it, a couple of the uh, websites picked up on it and made it their pick of the week or whatever, and that brought in a tremendous number of visitors. Abbott and Costello. Brett Chayden helped turn Kevin Bacon into a cult figure and the inspiration for a major scientific breakthrough. With Kevin Bacon. People kept saying to us when we would talk about Six Degrees that, oh yeah, that's the Six Degrees of Pe Kevin Bacon game that everyone was playing at that time. But we thought, well, actually, it's a scientifically serious thing. So we wrote to, to Brett and said, look, you know, we're doing research on networks and, and, you know, we think that you have this really interesting data and would you mind if we had it? Always well dressed. And to their astonishment, the Hollywood network conformed precisely to the theory. A few random links shrunk connections between a million actors. The model worked almost perfectly. There was an incredibly high level of clustering. But it was also the case that everyone could reach everyone uh, through just a few steps. If you looked at any two actors, the typical number of steps between them, people you've never heard of, was about somewhere between three and four. Hey, I am the center of the universe. Without even knowing it, Kevin Bacon had inspired the first real evidence that small worlds existed. To prove their theory was universal, Watson Strogatz needed to find small worlds in different networks. Tests have proven the great power system ready for transmission. Stretched like a spider web across America lies a massive network of power plants with enough high voltage cables to reach the moon. It's been described as the world's largest machine. So it was a kind of a, an organism that grew itself. The grid is the result of thousands of random events as new generators and cables were added to meet the growing demands of America's industry and population. We found that it too was a small world that even though it had 5,000 power plants over half a continent of area, it only took a very few hops to get from any one to any other. We thought, okay, you know, let's be ambitious here. Let's think about, you know, completely different kinds of networks. I had heard that every neuron in your brain is just a few synapses away from every other neuron. But we were now in a position to be able to prove that that really was right. There is only one nervous system that has been fully mapped. The nervous system of a worm called C. elegans. 
And that, we found, was a small world also. We found the same kind of result, short path lengths, high clustering. It was like time to uncork the champagne for both of us. It was very, very thrilling. They'd uncovered the invisible links that make the big world small. And there was a staggering implication in their discovery. What goes around comes around faster than you think. Most of the packages in our experiment are on their way. In Germany, Jessica is following the progress of her letter online. So far, it's made it to Toronto. In Paris, the dancer Nadia is on vacation, and her friend has found her package has come back from Boston unopened. This is Nadia's letter. It gets returned, so I guess it didn't make it. From 40 original starting points, 27 are still on their way somewhere, even crossing paths as they pass through the giant sorting hubs of the courier companies. And it's the significance of hubs that would be the next big discovery in network science. While Strogatz and Watts were pioneering small worlds, another scientist was looking at networks from a different angle. For Hungarian scientist Albert Laszlo Barabashi, understanding networks held the promise of predicting the future. His inspiration came from a classic work of science fiction, Isaac Asimov's Foundation. I have said the empire will lie in ruins within the next century. Asimov's Foundation centers on a mathematician with the ability to predict the future. But Barabashi had identified a flaw in the story. I started thinking, what is that I could do to predict the future? I realize that what is missing from Asimov's thinking is the network, the structure and the behavior of the network. Because events are never isolated. They depend on each other. They interact with each other. So we need to understand how they interact. To understand these interactions, Barabashi needed a network that had been thoroughly mapped. The major problem was that the data was incredibly difficult to find. But then everything changed. It was the mid-1990s, and the World Wide Web was exploding in popularity. Here was a huge network he could map by tracing the links between web pages. No one directed the growth of the web. Anyone could put up a site and link to wherever they liked. So the expectation was that the structure of the web would be entirely random. If the World Wide Web could be a random network, then the distribution of the links follows a bell curve. I would find something similar to this. If the web was random, most web pages would have a similar number of links. But what Professor Barabashi found was very different. The links were not evenly spread. Most had very few, but there were some with a huge and growing number of connections. We found a few web pages that had thousands of links pointing to them. And these were the hubs. It was completely new, completely unexpected. First, we did not know what to do with that. This was no random world. It seemed to have an organizing principle based around hubs. In these early days of the web, long before the familiar super sites of today had emerged, Barabashi glimpsed the future. It predicted the potential for the existence of huge hubs like Amazon and Google and Yahoo turn out to be. Barabashi's hunch was that behind this pattern, there may be a deeper truth lurking. By coincidence, Watts had just published his paper on the small world of Hollywood actors. Barabashi wondered if there could be hubs there too. 
I got an email from Laszlo Barabasi and he said, would I mind sharing some of the, the data? We saw exactly the same pattern as we observed earlier on the World Wide Web. There were many, many actors that had only a few links to other actors. There were a few major hubs, however. Finding hubs in Hollywood was a major breakthrough. It suggested that networks didn't just grow accidentally. They evolved according to some pattern. And if so, hubs should be everywhere. And sure enough, Barabashi came across hub networks in transportation routes, in computer chips, and within the human cell. I kept thinking, how is it possible? Because they cannot be more different in the scope, in the mate, and their nature. The more I thought about it, more I realized that there must be a simple explanation for that, because these are such a different systems that the only way they could be similar to each other is that there is one simple law that describes the structure of all of them. And he discovered that simple equation that describes our complex, interconnected world. PK equal K to the minus gamma. That is the formula. Here was the secret behind every growing network, the technique that nature uses to spin its webs. And once it could be seen, it revealed networks have strengths and weaknesses with implications for all of us. There are hundreds and thousands and potentially millions of errors in my cell. And yet, I don't even notice. The internet can work even when hundreds of its routers are not functional. If you remove the small nodes, it does not matter. The network will shrink, but will not fall apart. But there is a price you pay for this extreme robustness. If you remove the hubs, the system will fall apart. Watson Barabashi had revealed the hidden pattern behind networks. They'd become hubs themselves. Their studies now often referred to by other scientists as researchers from many disciplines explore the power of six degrees. Society has its hubs too, people who are much more connected than the rest of us. German lawyer Philip Thomas is one of them, and it's made him the obvious target for someone sending a package from Burma. Well, the one who sent the package to me is uh, Michael Newent, an old friend uh, from Burma. He's actually a strain Burmese. Burma is a fairly isolated place, so uh, Burmese, unfortunately, don't have too many contacts to the outside world. Michael knows that um, I have uh, family spread in the US, so um, it must have been pretty obvious for Michael that I might be one potential link in that chain. Scientists investigating six degrees have discovered that random links and hubs make the world small, allowing everything to travel far and fast on the network. This can be good news or totally devastating. It depends, of course, on what's spreading on the network. I love to cook. That's something that I always loved since uh, I was a teenager. When you merge different flavors, you get something which is completely new that is really uh, exciting. That's somehow what happened, I believe, for me in science. Alessandro Vespignani is one of the first to put the new understanding of networks to practical use. And his findings could save millions of lives. His specialty is diffusion. What happens when things mix together? Especially when a computer virus enters the internet. In 2000, the I Love You virus spread around the globe in just hours. 
and penetrated the CIA, the Pentagon, and the Houses of Parliament. Vespignani was puzzled by its rapid spread and by its resilience. Even though software to kill the bug was released within a day, it survived for months. The quicker is the disease at the beginning, the quicker it should die out from the system. And actually, this was not the case. We were really puzzled by this fact that the high of your virus was lingering in the wild. Like other scientists, Vespignani assumed that viruses spread at random. We were, you know, trying a few things, and actually something at a certain point that was struck by a paper. It was Barabashi's study showing the Internet had a definite structure. When I saw that image of the Internet, I thought that that was the pattern that I had to include in the model in order to get a realistic description of what was happening with computer viruses. By mixing his knowledge of diffusion with the map of the Internet, Vespignani discovered I Love You would move unstoppably through the hubs and hide in the far reaches of the net. And as he was about to learn, this will have implications far beyond the Internet. Vespignani's group is now modeling the intersection of global transport networks and disease they can predict the spread of a new flu virus, and the results are alarming. Airline networks are dominated by a few major airports, and once an infected person passes through one of these hubs, the virus will be unstoppable. But Vespignani's research also offers a solution. The way to prevent a global catastrophe is by sharing precious antivirals. What you find is that is beneficial to the entire world and to each country to share antivirus, to be cooperative and not to be selfish. We form a global network and whatever we do is going to reverberate across the network and have important implication at the, uh, at the global level. Understanding six degrees may be the planet's best hope of dealing with some of our most complex problems. West Point, 200 years uninterrupted by progress. The predictive power of networks is attracting intense interest and changing some old ways of thinking. Is there one note that sticks out at you that we would want to remove? The center note. The center note, how come? <coughs> so it's got the most connections, that's right. We can take a network of different terrorists and how they interact with each other and how they link up and from that, we can determine who the key leaders are in these groups and who it is we need to target in order to break up these cells and prevent further terrorist activity. The first application of this new paradigm was also the most spectacular. Network science principles led directly to the capture of Saddam Hussein. Ladies and gentlemen, we got him. The way we were able to capture Saddam Hussein was not through his utilizing cell phones or any type of communication device, but the social network structure of family and supporters that existed. We were able to identify the particular nodes of communication amongst those individuals, what they were saying, and based on that and the location, we were able to pinpoint where he was. Understanding and applying network science will revolutionize battlefield tactics. Are you Mr. Thomas? Yes, I am. I have a delivery for you. Thank you. It's a letter about that old paradigm, six degrees of separation. I'm supposed... The final destination? The final destination is this um, geneticist at Harvard by the name of Mark Vidal. But I know somebody at Harvard that I can mail this to. It's Michael Miller. Perfect. I figure he either knows um, Dr. Vidal or knows somebody who knows Dr. Vidal. Mark 
Vidal, the target of our experiment, is a geneticist. For him, the Six Degrees experiment is part of a much greater project, creating the first roadmap of the human cell. Imagine if we try to understand traffic in a city without having any maps, without having any idea of how interconnected the different roads are. Analogies are never perfect, but it's one way that I can imagine how things occur in the cell. Cells are the building blocks of life and hold the genes that determine our development. Those genetic instructions are carried out by thousands of proteins. The proteins are the little tools, the parts of the cell. They don't work in isolation. They interact with each other. In Vidal's bustling cellular city, proteins are like people, constantly on the move and communicating with one another. If I start from my favorite protein and I ask, what does it interact with? I'm now back to basically a problem of six degrees of separation. Who is connected to whom? Vidal believes that if he produces a map, then potentially he could locate malfunctions in the cell that cause disease. Diseases like cancer, where the genetic signal to kill a cell has been lost. And so I devoted my life to, to trying to understand the interconnectivity between genes. Mark Vidal goes to every single molecule and say, whom do you interact with? Now he goes to those molecules and say, whom do you interact with? And step by step, produces, generates us a network of the cell in the same way that in 99 we created a map of the World Wide Web. He did not know about us. I had no idea about him. Everybody thought he's crazy. The vast majority of biologists would have thought that even if we had a good quality map of the wiring diagram of the cell, not much really interesting would emerge out of it. But a chance encounter in the library left him reassured he was onto something. It was Barabashi's paper describing a universal law in networks. And this really was an eye opener. What became immediately obvious to me when I opened that magazine, it would be incredible if we could actually use it in the context of cellular networks and try to use similar models to explain human disease. Seeing disease as a network means it's no longer just about biology. It's become a math problem. And this offers entirely new ways of dealing with disease. So promising that Barabashi has joined forces with Vidal to explore the potential. And also from here, One day, Lazo came to my office all excited, saying, what if we looked at all the connections at the same time for all diseases and all genes involved in diseases? The result is the most remarkable network map of all. It shows for the first time connections between every known human disease. And just as the actor's network links stars through their films, we can now see how diseases are linked by the genes they have in common. The network that came out of this analysis had absolutely incredible properties. For one thing, in many diseases, we still don't know all the genes that are involved in those diseases. Breast cancer is one example of that. And so using maps such as that one, that can help us finding the genes that have remained a mystery uh, up until now. Laurie Benson is a young mother fighting breast cancer. It's already claimed the lives of two women in her family. Science has only identified 10% of the genes responsible for breast cancers, and that severely limits the effectiveness of treatments. I was 38. My daughter was 14 months old. And from the day that I found out to the day I went into surgery it was only 10 days. With a daughter who may also be carrying the faulty genes, she's keen to know more. Vidal's research could offer a dramatic shortcut to finding the root cause of the disease. Fine, nice to meet you. Very nice Great. to see you. How's your trip? Very good. Yeah, come in, please. Anyway, so what I want to show you here, we use 
yeast cells, which you can actually see on, on this plate over here. Vidal places human proteins into yeast cells and then waits to see which ones interact with each other. So the ones that don't have any growth that means they're not connected? Exactly. Okay. Of course, this is a very small experiment and you have to imagine hundreds and thousands and thousands of plates like this one, which then allow us to say, those pairs do not interact, those pairs they do. Let's draw the network, let's study it, and let's try to extract biological information from, from that. Okay. How is it going to be actually applied to treating people? The effect of a drug might be very different in one individual relative to another one, mm -hmm. considering the, the nature and the, the properties of this, of this big network over here. And to individualize along. the treatment. And individualize, exact, personalized. Okay. That's certainly the hope. Vidal's work remains experimental, but his network maps may be the best hope for future generations of Laurie's family. From Hollywood to math equation, to a daring new approach to fighting disease, this is the promise of network science, a new way of seeing our world. A package has arrived at Mark Vidal's office. I have a package for Mark Vidal. He's marking. He is, but while you're walking over there, would you please sure. pass that on to him? No problem. Hi, Mark. Right. Oops, sorry. Hey, Basil, <laughs> how are you? Hey, good to see you. <laughs> good to see you. <laughs> there is something for you. Let's see the story with this one. All right, let's see what you got okay, here. Okay, so... This package has traveled more than 6,000 miles. This? So this is a lady called Nyaloka Oma. Okay. We went from a small town in Kenya all the way to Boston. Two, three, four, five, six. Six, six, six there degrees you of separation. Are. There you are. Perfect. <laughs> six degrees is not an urban myth after all. In a few short steps, we've gone from crickets to Kevin Bacon to a new approach to fighting cancer. A decade on, Bacon has decided he might as well accept his cult status. When I first heard about the six degrees of Kevin Bacon game, I was really kind of horrified. I thought it was a joke at my expense. And I was hoping that it would go the way of the Pet Rocks and 8-track cassette tapes, but it seems to be hanging on. Now he's put the power of social networking to good use, launching a charity website, 6degrees.org. The site lets people link friends and their friends to good causes like Mark Vidal's work at Dana-Farber. I want to make a plea that we use the power of 6 Degrees and social networks and make a donation to Vidal's lab. To me, his work sounds like our greatest hope for finding a cure. Our packages have passed through 28 countries and 53 cities. Three chains made it to Mark Vidal, and they averaged six steps in getting there. Six Degrees has revealed a new view of nature, a reminder that if the world is small, then we're all in this together. Everything appears to be connected in ways that, you know, were absolutely not predictable just 10 years ago or even five years ago. It's going to completely change the way we think about the world. All the major problems in science today depend on understanding networks. Network science is the foundation of the 21st century.